with Gary Massey. Uh, we're actually in Krakow. We're in Krakow, yes. In, in Poland. Poland. Mm -hmm. Gary, what do you do? I am, I've just become director of the uh, Institute of Translation and Interpreting at the Zurich University. Oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, also head of the MA in Applied Linguistics with its, it gets a bit complicated now, with its three specialisations, mm -hmm. one in conference interpreting, one in specialised for what we call professional translation and the third in organisational communication. Wow, so that, yeah. that's applied linguistics, translation, interpreting, yeah. and organisational organization. communication. What is that? What's the third one? It's organisational communication is a strand or a specialisation designed to pick up students from our sister institute of uh, applied media studies. Uh, they study journalism and uh, organisation organizational communication at a, at a lower level of BA mm -hmm. and the idea is that um, our applied linguistics MA will try to try to offer each three target groups something at a higher level as I said in terms yeah. of translation. So these are master's levels? All these, master's these, are, right. okay. these are all MAs. So you're drawing people from different backgrounds? Yes okay. and we offer a BA of course in uh, what we call applied language Yes. In our institute. So translation, translation interpreting is not at BA level? Or uh, no, uh, not in that sense. Uh, we, we used to be called translation at BA level, um, but we decided that this was not an appropriate label. Yeah. Given the employment profiles yeah. of our graduates, yeah. um, many of our graduates, about 80% of our BA graduates, go out of work, and only about 10% of those would work as translators. Um, one of the reasons being that the six semester system, the three year training that we have at BA level is not sufficient to bring them up to speed, in our opinion. Okay, so what do you call that then at applied BA level? Language. Applied language. Applied language, not mediation or anything like that. Applied language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, that's interesting. Close to the, I think it's uh, very like the French system. Long s'applique? Yeah. Long s'applique, I think. Long étranger s'applique. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So uh, that's a pretty low flow on work from a a BA to MA. Is it that yeah, eighty percent is your is eighty percent, uh, roughly eighty percent. Will this has to do with the uh, peculiar situation of the University of Applied Sciences in Switzerland, because they uh, we, we we have to prove that um, people at uh, MA level, uh, sorry, BA level, have to. Uh, have to go out and be able to have a okay. and, uh, that, that that would if I did that in Spain that would be non realistic, I think. Mm. I mean you, you must have high language levels when you come in. Yes, C one. Okay, yeah. We we, we have a, a, a an entrance test called it's an aptitude yeah. test at BA level which uh, requires C one at all uh, with all the three languages they have. Okay. Well they've got one mother tongue and two foreign languages at C one okay. level. Gary, you're not Swiss, are you? No. <laughs> Pretty. Yeah. Uh, what goes take us back? What were you doing in your mid twenties? Where were you? Mid twenties, I had just qualified from University College London in Germanic studies uh, with a PhD, mm -hmm. um, and I had just accepted a job at. Zurich University, which is not the same as mm -hmm. the University of Applied Sciences, in the English department as a lector, okay. teaching English language and English literature. So your PhD was in what then? Germanic studies, German but literature. German literature, literature basically. Okay. Yes. Yes. So n nothing to do with what you're doing now? Or what nothing happened at all, apart from the fact that when I did an MA, which was at Manchester University, I did comparative literary studies and mm -hmm. uh, one or two modules on that MA, it was a taught MA, involved translation studies. Okay, within Complete? Then. Within Complete, yeah. That's it. Which was fairly traditional, I think, at that time. Oh, that, yeah. was, that was, in many ways, in the UK, the origin of translation studies at university, yes. I believe. Yes. So you, you come from comparative literature, dramatic studies. Yeah. Do you do any literary translation? I think like no, that now, or not, not at all. None at all. Do you regret that transition? Uh, no, I don't regret it. Uh, what happened was that when I arrived in Switzerland, uh, my job at the university 
involved uh, a fairly moderate teaching load, 10 hours a week, compared to what our teachers at the uh, University of Applied Sciences have. Uh, 100% is, is, is nothing. They teach 22 hours a week. So Class time, yes, contact, yes, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. so uh, I have time on my hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I was a native speaker of English, many people got in touch with me to do translations. Okay. Um, and with not a time English, you could still get a lot of jobs in Switzerland. Good. Good. So you came into the profession more than coming in intellectually, academically. You that became a translator. Right. Absolutely. Yes. To get money, is that? I'm putting to get words money. on this. Is that to get money, to get experience, yeah, yeah. to enjoy translation. So you were interested in it. Then. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. I find it fascinating. But no, you weren't trained as a translator, though. No. Don't tell anybody. I won't tell anybody. No, no, don't tell anybody no. about me. <laughs> <laughs> so how did, how did that transition work then? Because you were, you were teaching English, basically. Yes, I was teaching English, uh, but of course, you know, some of the modules, as I said, most uh, universities, both in the UK and abroad, were translation modules. So I was teaching German English, English German translation, mm -hmm. Zurich being a German speaking yeah. canto, and um, I. I began my translation career by translating a book on Nietzsche um, from German into English. And I got various jobs then from commercial organizations, usually banks, insurance companies, it's famous for that. Mm -hmm. And gradually I increased my translation load to the extent that when I when my contract, my three-year contract expired, I was employed as a staff translator by the Swiss Insurance Company. I imagine with a good salary. Yes, the salaries are high yeah. in Switzerland. Yeah. They, they remain high for translators yeah. compared to the rest of Europe, I would say. No, I was recently criticised for not advertising the fact that translators can earn high salaries. Ah. So let it be known. Translators yeah, can earn high can. salaries. They can. Working in Switzerland for big companies. Yes, if they have English as a mother tongue. There you go. Yes, yes. Yes. Or if they have very good English as a free language, yeah. which is what we train up students to do. Um, the MA students that we have are largely of uh, German mother tongue. We will have Italian and French mother tongue students, uh, occasionally English mother tongue student, but largely German mother tongue students. And of course the market can become saturated after a while. Yeah. And if they can offer English, there is a huge volume of work into English. Work into English. English. Yes. Yes. As, a, as an active foreign language, uh, we offer English as a B language, we do do B language uh, training. Um, with English, they will probably get a job as a B language. The volume exceeds the, uh, the, 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 the number of English yeah, and translators. Yeah, pretty general. In yeah. these days. Tell us about your research and how did you get into the research side of translation? Um, that happened when we, I, just after. Um, after working for the for the Swiss Insurance Company, I was contacted by a um, a, uni a, a, a school that I didn't actually hadn't heard about. It was the Dolmetscher in Zurich, the uh, interpreter, sorry, interpreter school, a vocational school for training uh, translators and interpreters. And uh, they asked me to do a couple of courses, which I was happy to do. And I really enjoyed the teaching. And eventually, um, you, you were training interpreters then. Translators. Oh, right. It was yeah. Within the dog yeah. that they, they basically was largely training translators okay. rather than interpreters. And uh, that's how I got into the teaching of, uh, of professional translators. Um, I was a classic profession working on the outside, coming into uh, teaching yeah. courses, and they obviously liked what I did, so I got into it. But the school itself then was, as I said, a vocational school and uh, had very little research going on. Perhaps individual teachers would do a little bit on their own. But 10 years later, 1999, we became part of the University of Applied Sciences in Zurich. And they have a mandate that includes research and research-driven teaching. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, this had to be built up and that's why. So you were pushed into it then? In a sense, yes. Yeah. But uh, I had always been interested in research, although it was the hermeneutic research that is usually practiced in this literary level literary uh, scholars. And um, it was only later um, that I was aware of the potential of empirical research, mm -hmm. the more empirical uh, type, of, type, of, type of research being done here in the moment. And 
it's its cognitive basis. Yeah, you've, you've, you've turned full circle. In, in a sense, yes. Right. In a sense, yes. It's and it's not that I am impatient of literary research or human hermeneutics. It's just at the moment, given the fact that I'm trying to educate students for a real market, I find the empirical side more useful and more adaptable to my own educational needs within the programs. That Tell I us run. about some of the research you're doing or you have done. We do cognitive process research. We, I mean, uh, the team that's involved, mm -hmm. including Maury Evans Bergdahl. Um, and the idea here is that we're looking at the way translators actually work and at the workplace and at all levels of competence. So students, um, beginners, BA beginners, MA, should we say novices, and uh, professionals. And the data that we get, we look at their processes, we record their processes on screen, we get them to talk about what they're doing, typical cognitive mm -hmm. research methods. And um, we use that data um, to develop our own programs and start with things to develop, develop your teaching programs. Yes. Right. Yes. So it's not doing the research, false, getting the hypothesis, testing it, and here's your result. And what do we do with it? You're, you're applying it straight away. Yes. We sense. have to do that. That's part of the brief that we have. Yeah. We must. Another. It's not a problem. I find it actually a challenge of, of University of Applied Sciences in, in Switzerland, and I think also in Germany, is that we have to do applied research, and that research must have specific outcomes, and another way to ensure the specific outcomes, it must be third party funded, mm -hmm. either by an external funding agency okay. or by an industrial partner. So where do you get the money? We get the money from um, funding agencies, the Swiss National Science Foundation, who will often stipulate an industrial partner, mm -hmm. and one of those, uh, I mean, obviously because we have a lot of graduates out there on the market who are now in local, uh, local translation companies, yeah. we find that they are very keen to uh, get involved in our, in our research projects. Why would they do that? They find that what we're doing could help them train their staff okay. and perhaps to optimize their workflows. Okay. Well, is it also a question of prestige for them? So the company I to say that they participate so. in research? Definitely. No, it's an interesting model, and it's something I think we should be pursuing in many other areas as well. So you're working for big companies from within the university, is that the story? or I'm not working for I mean, I don't want to say working for people. Well, I mean, it's funded research. Um, it's funded research, yes. Uh, it's, it's a model that is well known in the engineering sciences, for instance, and the uh, uh, fact is that we are fairly unusual in our own University of Applied Sciences, being the only de we call it department in a school that really, one could say, is a very humanities-based school. Mm -hmm. uh, the university has in very strong engineering and business departments, um, architecture departments, psych psycho psycho psychology departments, social work department. Um, not necessarily the typical type of uh, university structure one would expect in a traditional university. Is there a clean break from the hermeneutic tradition, which is putting a good name on pretty talk about kind of research? I don't know. Um, is it a complete break, or do the kinds of things we used to do in comparative literature still happen in the research process? I and mean, you still have to interpret data. Absolutely. You still have to make sense of yes. these disparate bits of It's like reading a complex text, or is it? Of or is it course, entirely different? Of course, of course, and this is where I think... I'm just worried about these debates between the hermeneutic tradition and the empirical no, tradition. I, I don't see them together. I don't see it either. I mean, we work with qualitative data for a start. Sure. That's the best buy. I mean, we can number crunch, we can, we can, we can do what we want with it in quantitative terms. But basically, the bottom line is that, especially when we're applying it to, to a didactic situation, we're working with qualitative data and that requires interpretation. And I think that that's perhaps personally for me why I found it easier perhaps than others would to switch. Simply because what happens is because we work in research teams is that um, we'll have specialists in cognitive process research from, from the data gathering methodological side. 
Um, and I think we complement each other in that perhaps the interpret on perhaps a little bit stronger in being able to interpret the mm -hmm. data, uh, whereas others are far stronger in statistical analysis. Okay, so yes, <laughs> yes, you don't want to leave to the other guys. Gary, what kind of research do you think we, sh we need on translation studies? Research? I, I'm just not advocate of the research that we've been doing up to now. Yes. But going forward, what we've found is that in our cognitive research up to now, or up to very recently, we've been looking at the act of translation, the idea of you know, the way a translator alone sitting in front of a computer goes about the activity of translation and what the processes are. But increasingly, we, when we were doing our research in one of our bigger projects a few years ago, we noticed that we couldn't exclude, we couldn't kind of, um, ignore the extraneous factors, the situators, the situation of translation. And now we are going, going moving out of the human brain mm -hmm. into the situation, the workplace, yeah. the attributes, the ergonomics of translation. And I think that our research anyway will be going further in that direction. Okay. We're looking at physical ergonomics, cognitive ergonomics, but increasingly we're interested in organizational ergonomics, which squares nicely again with our organization communications. Sure. Right. Brilliant. Is there a problem with generalizability with that kind of study? Yes. And how do you go beyond or don't isn't that a problem? Because it feeds uh, straight back into the training. <laughs> Within our institutional context, when it goes back into the training, I don't find that a problem. When we act, though, when we are trying to make general statements about, for instance, competence acquisition um, and um, the way in which translators do or do not benefit from their environments, are constrained by certain elements, um, I think we need more data. I think we need. At the moment, our database is large, but not huge. I mean, if we look at medical sciences, it's, it's, it's very little. Um, and I think what perhaps would be very helpful in our field would be if all these smaller research teams in the process area, for instance, were to get together and share their data mm -hmm. a little bit more, make it more available. I think the will is there, but the platforms aren't there. And I see that as a, as a distinct possibility. We're a member of... Uh, but does anybody not share data? No, they do it's share data, they, but is, is it available? Is it metatyped in the same way? Do we yeah, sure. That's, that's how it's it like a coordination. Sure. Sure. And I, think, I don't think anybody doesn't want to share the data. Mm -hmm. I think we're at a stage where we could and should, I think, um, create accessible platforms for that. I mean, Susanna Gupfeller has done that mm -hmm. with a transcom um, project. Mm -hmm. Um, but I must confess that I have never really had time to get into the niceties of, of, of the way to use that data. And because it's been collected with certain hypotheses and certain outcomes in mind, perhaps it's not fully compatible with our goals. But I think that, if I come back to the to, to, uh, initiatives such as, such as the uh, Trek initiative, which is uh, kind of like a, a network of, of process mm -hmm. researchers, yeah. Um, we don't have individual resources to collect the, the big data, but if we can pool our resources, I think the generalizability, generalizability of the data will become a bit more convincing. Okay. <laughs> Gary, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.